do us a quick favor guys hit the follow subscribe button share this with someone who would benefit from it and help us grow as the more we grow the better the episodes we get thanks guys for helping us and let's get into the episode it's not fun right i don't have that enjoyment because i'm not confident i'm willing to bear that out to get over the goldilocks effect to where i have some enjoyment and then when i become more confident i have more enjoyment and i start to feel fulfillment then this is where that so-called passion comes in okay so passion for me is very transferable intrinsically but then also externally it's very transferable so when some people put value on something i then have more inclinedness to be passionate towards because there is perceived value and if it's social proof enough then that general consensus is that people find this of value therefore of my pursuit of it if i then find confidence enjoyment and fulfillment through those things then it's 10x and he's here he is here cristiano has entered the building Welcome back to this episode of Sculpt Podcast. In today's episode, we are going through why passion is fake, which is a weird one, maybe an uncomfortable truth, or maybe just a layer peeled back from the onion, revealing what it truly is. This is an episode that I've thought about for a while. It's not the... It's not a fact. I can't say this is a fact, although I'm providing evidence to where this could be legitimately taken, I think. So I've come with research, I've come with paradoxes, I've come with philosophies that should back my theory. Now, this isn't a theory that is commonly accepted or commonly known, right? This is just my my own kind of philosophies and theories with evidence backing it so with that being said i want to get straight into this and i want to talk about passion is a mask for a psychological philosophy known as social proof or social influence and what social proofing is is how people tend to adapt the beliefs values and behaviors of a group which especially if they perceive that to be a higher value or as the norm essentially. So what I mean by that, and of course I have a lot of notes here, okay. Uh, What I mean by that is that when a group of people commonly accept or commonly come together to value something as a higher thing or a something of value, people then value it and, and seek this thing. This could be a car. Let's say people in this group typically believe that this car is the best car out of all cars. Now, someone who is in that group, who may not agree with it completely, but they have been in this group and they have been almost convinced. The social influence has convinced them to believe this. And when they have a conversation, they have confirmation bias within that group, which then creates social proof behind this idea. Now, someone who is in that group may say they then have a passion for that car. They want to learn about it. They want to enjoy that car. They want to purchase that car. Okay? This whole philosophy behind passion is a mask through social influence and social proofing. Now, when we look at that on a much grander scheme, if we look at the world and we think about the common influences and the common social proof structures that we have, If we're thinking about a personal thing for myself, I don't have a passion for football, right? I have a passion for the pursuit of becoming the best footballer, but that passion is actually a mask for the social influence. There is only a passion there because people value it. There is only a passion there because it is a social social proof concept. Professional football is a concept which then gives me things back It's an exchange, and if you were to take football away from me, the passion doesn't just disappear. There is still passion, although that passion is only there because other people perceive it 
to be a higher value. It's not because I love the way that my foot kicks a ball. It's not the way that I love the the ref blowing his whistle. It's not because of these small minor details. It's actually got to do with the social influence and social structure around that, surrounding that thing, if that makes sense. Now, I can give you an analogy, which has to do with the fashion trends and how we see passion and influence in around people change quite quickly. So imagine a bustling city where fashion reigns supreme. In this city, people are continually seeking the latest fashion trends to define, to define their personal style. Here we find an intriguing phenomenon that mirrors the concept of passion being influenced by societal norms. So the birth of trend. Just as passion can be swayed by collective values, a new fashion trend emerges from a designer's sketchbook or a celebrity's red carpet appearance. It's fresh, unique, and daringly different. The early adopters. A handful of fashion forward individuals eagerly embraced this trend, showcasing it profoundly in public. Much like early adopters of a new idea, they are trendsetters, setting the stage for what's to come. Social proof in action. Here's where it gets interesting. As more and more people witness these early adopters flaunting this trend, they start to take notice. The trend begins to gain momentum, and not because of any inherent superiority, but because of social proof. The idea that if others value it, it must be valuable. So this is like with football. If it's the biggest sport in the world and so many people value it, then it must be valuable. So this idea of it being social proof, then I must value it because everyone else values it. Mass adoption. As the trend spreads like wildfire, people who may not have initially been drawn to it suddenly find themselves curious. They see it everywhere. On the streets, in the magazines, and on social media, it becomes the in thing. The influence of social norms. The paradox lies in the fact that individuals who had never thought about this trend before now consider it a must-have. They feel a sudden pressure to conform to the fashion norms of their society. Even through, even though their initial interest was minimal, the collective opinion of others has swayed them. The authentic versus the influence. In the end, you have two types of trend followers. Those who genuinely resonate with this trend, finding a sense of identity and self-expression through it, and those who jumped on the bandwagon due to societal influence, perhaps feeling a bit like imposters. Now, if we're thinking about this in football, people who love playing football, it may be, and this is the next point that I go into, it may be because of a set of reasons, not because of societal uh, influences. For me... The reason why I have a passion for football, I can tell you that it's not because of those reasons inherently, it's because of the external reasons. The reason why I want to become a professional footballer isn't because I had a calling, it was a passion. That's not why. And that is never really the reason why, and I'll go into that later. But for me, it's because of the external. Now, is that the right way of doing it? Is that the wrong way of doing it? I can't tell you what's the right or wrong way of doing it, right? But I can tell you that there are people at the top who aren't doing it because they love. Okay? And I, I think that that's actually a better way of doing it, which I've talked to about it for. So, after the unmasking of authentic style... Sorry, this is the next one. So, as time goes on, some individuals upon inspection realise that this trend they embrace was more than about conformity than genuine passion for fashion. A few. <laughs> they may go on to discover their authentic style, one that truly represents their personality and preferences. So, the analogy reveals that as societal influences can lead to people to adapt fashion trends without genuine passion, it can also sway individuals into pursuing interests or careers that align with the collective rather than their true intrinsic passions. The key takeaway is that self-awareness and the courage to explore one's authentic desires are essential in both realms of fashion and personal passion. So, with this, as I was saying, the passion very often can change, okay? If I am passionate for football, I can also be passionate about something else because the value is very interchangeable. If I am passionate about something, the concept has to be pretty social proof and there has to be value placed upon that thing. If I am passionate for something that is very minuscule, which people have, people do have this, but it's because they have either the next thing that I'll mention, I don't know, I think it's the next thing, or... Because there is perceived value behind that. Okay, this is the next thing. So, 
for those people who aren't influenced by the external, the people who are influenced by the internal, this comes through the realm with there is passion there through confidence, enjoyment, and fulfillment. Now, these things are in, three things are interlocked. So the Goldilocks, the Goldilocks curve is something where people will then start to achieve a passion. Now, if you're not familiar with the Goldilocks curve, it's kind of like that slow state that you achieve after the doing the dirty work. So if you were to start with football and you were completely uncoordinated, you couldn't kick a ball and things like that, it's a very, uh, I think the word is linear, where it's the graph is like uh, an exponential graph. So it's once you get over that first little boundary, so for football, if you're really, really uncoordinated and then you don't see any results from, you know, two days in training, or if you're able to train for a year and you're able to get coordinated, if you're able to go through that struggle, then you will then find competence, you will then find enjoyment, and then you will then find fulfillment. And these things will then create a passion for that thing. So, competence. If you are an incompetent person at doing something, it is very unlikely that you'll find passion. Okay? And most people will probably be incompetent at most things that they start out at. Now, there are genetic dispossessions which might elevate a person to be more genetically inclined to be competent at something. Therefore, like for football, if you are genetically more coordinate, coordinated than someone else or you are just generally more coordinated than someone else because of your lifestyle or because of your upbringing, you have a higher level of competence towards something. So that may be an athletic person. They have a higher level of competence towards football. Therefore, that they can do that sport and they can find enjoyment in it because they are competent. And then when you have more enjoyment in something and you are more competent in something, you have more fulfillment. And it's kind of a circle. So through the competence and enjoyment, you then have fulfillment. Okay, so then this is where the passion comes from. You only become passionate for something if intrinsically, if these three things are in line, okay? You don't really become passionate about something if you're not competent at it, okay? You don't really become passionate about something if you are competent at it and you enjoy it. If you find fulfillment in being competent and enjoying it, then you can be passionate about it, okay? But people saying that uh, you have to, you know, find your passion, you have to find your calling, things like that. You have to be passionate about what you do. I don't think that that's true, okay? Because you can become passionate about anything. I can become passionate about, I mean, for me, I've kind of wired myself to become passionate about anything. And I don't call it passion. I actually really hate the word passion. I think that I just have an obsession around it. And that's because I'm able to go through that, let's call it like that, that, that dark stage where it's just monotonous, it's very boring and very, it's not fun, right? I don't have that enjoyment because I'm not competent. I'm willing to bear that out to get over the Goldilocks effect to where I have some enjoyment. And then when I become more competent, I have more enjoyment and I start to feel fulfillment. Then this is where that so-called passion comes in, okay? So passion for me is very transferable intrinsically but then also externally, it's very transferable. So when some people put value on something, I then have more inclinedness to be passionate towards because there is perceived value. And if it's social proof enough, then that general consensus is that people find this of value, therefore my pursuit of it. If I then find competence, enjoyment and fulfillment through those things, then it's 10x, right? For, for me with football, I find competence, enjoyment and fulfillment through it. And then also the social external uh factors around it make me even more competent enjoyment and fulfilling essentially so here's an analogy for the passion competence enjoyment and fulfillment so the mastery of musical notes imagine you're learning to play a musical instrument set the piano at first at first you're a novice just starting to explore the world of music this journey mirrors the relationship between competence enjoyment and fulfillment so the novice piazza you begin as a novice stumbling over the keys struggling to read the sheet music and producing dissonant sounds. Playing the piano doesn't bring you much joy initially. The learning curve. As you persist, something interesting happens. You start to grasp the basic of the notes, the scowls, and hand movements. It's like learning the alphabet before you can read. You're becoming more competent. The tunes of competence. With growing competence, you can play simple tunes. These tunes, through basic, though basic, bring a hint of enjoyment. You no longer cringe at the cacophony, but begin to hear the melody, the melodic breakthrough. 
Here's when passion comes into play. After weeks or months of practice, you become more proficient enough to play more complex pieces. The notes flow naturally under your fingers and you, immer you find yourself immersed in the music. This newfound competence leads to genuine enjoyment. A full composition. As you continue to practice, you can now tackle entire compositions, perhaps even composing your own. The sense of fulfillment is immersed. You've reached a new level where playing the piano has become a source of deep satisfaction and passion. Beyond mastery. Beyond mastery, competence lies in mastery, where you can effortlessly interpret and convey complex emotions through your music. At this stage, you're not just playing the piano, you're loving it. So in the conclusion, this analogy illustrates how passion often emerges when one attains a certain level of competence. Much like the piano, life pursuits become more enjoyable and fulfilling as we become proficient in them. The key takeaway is that the journey from competence to passion is a process and the reward of patience and dedication are profound. So with that, I've explained how the more competent you become, the more enjoyment you have. And the more enjoyment you have and the more confident you become, the more fulfillment you have. You're building yourself. You're building character. You're building skills. You're building a successful uh, a, a successful asset, essentially. And when that's valued, when that's valued by the social norms or the, the societal influence, then that passion is immense. And now... I say passion because that's the generally accepted word, but when we break that down, is it actually passion or is it a societal influence and a breakdown of competence and enjoyment and fulfillment? That's what I actually think it is. Now, that is a mask for the word of passion, okay? Societal norms have a significant influence on shaping our passions and interests, okay? They impact our choices by providing validation, acceptance and a sense of belonging when we align with socially accepted activities or pursuits. Peer influence, cultural factors, media and economic trends also play a role in directing our passions. Educational systems, gender norms and social movements can further guide individuals towards specific passions. While conforming to social norms, they can provide a sense of identity. It's crucial for individuals to ensure that their passions are authentic and aligned with their values rather than solely driven by societal expectations. Now, I think that for me, if my passion for football was merely external and it was only by social norms and the factors outside of the internal, then I don't even think that that's that, that level of competence and whatnot, it's not true. Now, that gets filled out because if it is just external, then the intrinsic will never let you get to that level of external. Now, that's a little bit hard to understand, but if I'm going to give you an example of that, if I really, really want to become a footballer, a professional footballer, and I'm, I'm so passionate about becoming a professional footballer, but I'm then not doing the work behind to become that professional footballer because I'm not... I'm not competent, I don't find enjoyment, I'm not fulfilling the intrinsic need, then I will never get there anyway, okay? So that is a old sense of passion if you're just doing the external. So if you really want to be successful at something and you want to be passionate about it, then that passion has to be working in cohesion with the internal. So the internal and extrinsic have to go hand in hand. And you sometimes see people quit because the external isn't important to them. Now, when the external is important and the intrinsic is important, then this is where most people find success in something. A success through a passion, okay? Educational choices. So, according to a report by the National Center of Education Statistics, students often choose their majors and career paths based on factors such as parental influence, societal expectations, and perceived economic prospects, which is interesting. But it actually makes a lot of sense. You might think about it in your daily life, right? You might choose... Uh, a, a major because most of your friends did it or maybe the reason why you got into that was because that's what most of your friends were doing for me the reason why I got into football was actually because all of my friends were playing it and I sucked at it then my neighbor moves in next door professional football I give it some time all of a sudden you know what I want to be professional football I wasn't very confident I didn't really enjoy it 
and I didn't have my fulfillment. As soon as I got competent, I had more enjoyment. As soon as I got more enjoyment and competence, I had fulfillment. Okay. Gender norms. A study published in the Journal of Sex Roles found that societal gender norms strongly influence career choices. It revealed that women are more likely to pursue careers in nurturing fields, such as educational and healthcare, due to societal expectations. Media and pop culture research. Published in the journal Media Psychology, it highlights the impact of media and pop culture on career aspirations. That makes a lot of sense. Because celebrities, fictional characters, and media portrayals can influence young individuals and their career choices. I just mentioned there how the when my neighbor moves in next door to me, right? Massive influence. Social proofs it. I see the lifestyle. He took me to training one time. I saw it. Social proof that concept and that influence influenced me. Influence what I'm doing right now. It influenced I wouldn't be doing this podcast if he didn't move in next door to me. Well, maybe I would, but it wouldn't be a sculpted podcast. Maybe it could be, but it wouldn't be that same place. I wouldn't be talking about football. But because my neighbor moved in next door to me, because the peers around me were all playing football, this is the path I chose. It could have been any other path, but because of that's where I was in that moment and that time being, that's the path that I chose. Peer influence. A study in the Journal of Adolescence showed that adolescents often conform to the career aspirations of their peer groups, exactly what I said, leading to collective decisions influenced by social pressures. There we go. Economic trends. Research from the Pew Research Center indicates that economic conditions and job market trends influence career choices. Individuals may opt for careers that promise stability and financial security, even if those careers don't align with their passions. So if they, if that doesn't align with their intrinsic skill set of competence, enjoyment, and fulfillment, the F subtle is driving that decision choice. Now, when someone is going to be successful at that, they then have to adapt that intrinsic level of passion to that new thing. So they might not have passion for that new thing because they are incompetent at it. Okay, so what they have to go through is they have to go through that dark phase and that learning curve to then find a competence, enjoyment and fulfillment. So, I'm going to give you an analogy here. So, we all probably know keeping up with the Joneses. So imagine a neighborhood where everyone is trying to keep up with the Jones in terms of material possessions. So the Jones family set the trend by buying a new car and suddenly everyone else in the neighborhood starts purchasing new vehicles too. It's not because they are all passionate about cars, but because societal influence has made it seem like the socially acceptable thing to do, they all do it. Similarly, societal norms and influences can shape our passions, just as the Jones's choices influenced by the neighborhood's car purchases People might choose certain interests or careers, not because they are deeply passionate about them, but because they believe in that's what they should do based on the societal expectations. Critical thinking and self-awareness. Now, something that should be quite a, like, quite a common theme in all of this is my self-awareness of my intrinsic and external passions, right? I've already told you that the reason why I started playing football was not because of the intrinsic, it was because of the external. The reason why I keep playing football is because of the intrinsic and then it's obviously influenced by the value of the external, okay? So through this critical thinking and the self-awareness, your passion involves self-reflection. Disconnecting from external influences can be helpful, okay? Because if that external thing isn't there and it's driving internally, then you will find you know, maybe your true passion or what you, you really like to do because the enjoyment is there through confidence, okay? So, if you want to find your true passion, you could say, now, your true passion is so subjective because you know you can change it, right? It's, your true passion will be based on your experiences and, and your upbringing, essentially, because if you want to find enjoyment through the things you do, it has to come through a level of confidence. I don't have enjoyment in doing things that I'm not competent at. It's just not fun, right? So if we're thinking about a 20 year old who wants to try and that, find their true calling or true passion, then you have to look at how they grew up. Did they grow up where they were playing sports when they were younger or were they just in their rooms playing you know, video games or were they in their rooms being a tech developer, something like that? Because then finding their true passion, it will probably not be likely that it will be something that they are completely incompetent at, okay? So if we're thinking about a tech 
like a tech guy who's just been playing video games his whole life in his room. It's very unlikely that for the 20 years that he has been, well, obviously not 20, but for the however long he's been playing it in his adolescent years, to where he has had a level of competence through understanding technology, it's very unlikely that his true passion will be through something else because he's influences and, and if we're actually just completely forgetting about the external we're thinking about the internal the internal uh things that he's doing where his day-to-day life was influenced okay so we're bringing it a little bit back in but the the 20 years that he had before where the external was influencing him he's influenced to doing those things that he has been doing for those 20 years right so it's unlikely that he is going to do anything outside of what he's already competent at Okay, he can. It's going to be difficult. Maybe it's not worth him to. Maybe it's not worth him to do that. For him, twenty years old, kind of old, he should have a career going or some guidance already. Okay. If he was led to change that passion and go into something where he is genetically uh, maybe lowered compared to others in this field, or maybe he just wasn't ever experienced or competent at when he was younger. It's going to be much harder for him to succeed as that that learning curve to get over is going to be much more difficult. Then the external factors will then probably push him away from that. So then that passion that he may have had there is completely taken away from the external. But when they find something that is internal and it matches up with the external, then there is more passion there because of the competence, enjoyment, and fulfillment. That is a crazy concept to get around. And it's something that I've never heard anyone speak about, which which flaws my argument. You know, it could be completely incorrect. But I think that through the intrinsic and external, that's the true recipe for finding a passion. Now, again, I don't like the word passion. I don't like using it, but for the sake of the argument, I'm using it because I truly believe that it is a mask in much more of a deeper subject. So do with that what you will. Make sure you like this uh, episode. Make sure you share it with a friend if you find it helpful. And we've got much more videos coming. We're making much more shorts. We've got the Sculptor app running up. Working on the Kickstarter project. And there's much more to come. So stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe and follow us. So yeah, thanks guys. And I'll see you in the next episode.